My name is Henry Atkins. I am the canon theologian in residence at Trinity Church Midtown. I want to welcome you to this Theology and Climate Crisis series. Um, the series is a four-part series. It will feature in the first section uh, Elizabeth Atkins, who is a student of political science and environmental justice at Rice, and also my granddaughter, and Eric Beam, who is a very active member also of Trinity and a geologist. Hello, my name is Libby Atkins. I am a junior studying at Rice University, majoring in policy analysis, environmental studies, and anthropology. I am also the niece of Hannah Atkins and the granddaughter of Henry Atkins. And I'm here today to talk to you about why compromising on climate change is no longer possible. Not only is our Earth dying, but we are actively killing it. This may seem like an exaggeration, but I assure you it is not. We often feel so far removed from the effects of climate change, but the truth is it is going to hit us harder than we think, and when it does, it will be too late. My goal is not to scare you, but to educate you on why our historic compromises on climate change policy are no longer possible. First, what is compromise in this sense? Compromising is an agreement met by each side making a concession. What is compromised in the case of the Earth? When it comes to climate change, it is our planet. We cannot make excuses in the name of compromise for the profits made off of natural gas and oil any longer. There are no concessions to be made by the Earth anymore. We cannot keep losing infrastructure, lives, forests, and species to the beast that is the very real global warming. And at the end of the day, we either do what the science says, for example, to aim for shorter term goals to fully eliminate fracking, to name an example, or we do not. We should have moved to eliminate carbon emissions by the year 2000, almost 20 years ago. But we've made excuse after excuse, including the complete denial of the scientific community's findings about global warming, and pushed climate action as a long term goal. A relevant example of compromise would be the 2015 International Climate Agreement that put forward lower and more achievable climate goals. The U.S. committed $3 billion to the International Green Fund under President Obama, a fund to assist the U.N. in preventing climate change-related consequences. We also compromised on highly lucrative fossil fuel production in favor of reducing carbon emissions. However astonishing the Paris Climate Agreement was, $3 billion is nothing compared to the actual costs. If we see a 3.7 degree Celsius or 38.6 degree Fahrenheit temperature increase, which is a little more than what we'd see if all the nations in the world met their obligations under the Paris Agreement, all of them, the damages that would result in that would cost us at a minimum more than $551 trillion. Some more examples of compromising on climate include the U.S.'s refusal to accept climate refugees under refugee status. This year alone, 17 million people were displaced due to climate change. In Alaska, Canada, and Siberia, the permafrost is melting to the point where people cannot live in villages and towns where the frozen dirt has sunk and collapsed their homes and roads. Instead, our politics are shifting away from compromise. Those who previously called for environmental stewardship to accompany energy production are now wanting to shut down the industry entirely, even though a two-degree climate scenario, such as the one promoted under the Paris Agreement, only dictates reductions in fossil fuel use, not an outright ban. Much of this is due to legal incentives for fracking, like tax breaks for major fossil fuel, major fossil fuel corporations. And these compromises being made by both sides include both parties failing to take the necessary action needed to save our planet. These long deadlines give greater incentives to no action for these companies, and they take their time to go carbon neutral. I want to share with you a quote from John Acheson a renowned climate scientist and activist. He says, First, saying we can't afford to do what's necessary to mitigate the greatest threat humanity's ever faced is about as smart as trying to save money by not changing the oil in your car. If you don't do it, your car will self-destruct. And if you don't address climate change, every aspect of the natural world and civilization as we know it will deteriorate, including the economy. End quote. Look at what it is already costing us, costing us lives, costing us infrastructure. We have legislation up that drastically pushes the U.S. towards zero carbon, such as the Green New Deal that builds green infrastructure, but money trumps all, money in politics, money in corporate greed, money in fracking. 
Being a policy student has opened my eyes to the reasons many legislators attempt to sweep the climate crisis under the rug. Money and greed are often the most driving forces for environmentally harmful resource mining processes, such as fracking in the oil and gas industry. The economic benefits are the primary reasons for these compromises regarding the climate crisis. Fracking has generated billions in economic re revenue and lined the pockets of many senators, including Texas Senators John Cornyn and Ted Cruz. Now is not the time to fill the pockets of the CEOs. Now is the time to invest in green energy and preserve our future. Taking action against compromising on climate change is individual action, but it is also the actions that need to be taken by our legislators and politicians. But our politicians will not take this action unless we fight for it as well. We cannot allow individual efforts to take the place of the major legislation that will create what we need for the future generations to be able to live happily on this earth. Sacrifices must be made, but sacrifices for the benefit of our future. No more compromises on our planet in the name of our planet should be made to further our selfish greed and drive for money here in the U.S. Hi, my name is Eric Beam. I'm a geologist. Uh, I've worked about 22 years in oil and gas. I've worked a little bit of consulting in coal and I had one summer job related to uh, nuclear power plant safety, so I've covered a lot of the energy business. And uh, Henry asked me to talk to you about the scientific basis for uh, global climate change, which I think is very solid, and I'm going to cover very simple theme today, but what I think are essentially incontrovertible facts, observations, and knowledge of how uh, the atmosphere and energy balance work that I think should provide us all a basis for uh, a common understanding of climate change. Let's get started. Today we'll cover the principles or processes behind climate change, the observations that tell us that it's happening, and a little bit of the history of the science and observations and tell us what we knew and when we knew it and what we knew about how serious the problem was. Underlying everything that's going on with climate change is the greenhouse effect, illustrated here with a greenhouse. Sun shines through the glass of the greenhouse and warms the objects inside plants or soil or people. Those warm people re-radiate that heat, but this time it's at a much longer wavelength, lower frequency. That frequency is unable to pass through the glass and is trapped within the greenhouse. Thus the greenhouse grows warmer than the outside. The earth works in a very similar way. The sun shines visible light through the earth's atmosphere. The land, the oceans, are warmed. These re-radiate heat just as the plants did, and that heat can't tra pass efficiently through our atmosphere. It traps the heat within the atmosphere, and the earth warms, just like the greenhouse. The earth is not enclosed in glass, of course. In the case of the earth's atmosphere, gas plays the role of greenhouse glass panes. But there's a variety of gases that uh, can block the transmission of longer wavelengths, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane. Uh, we'll concern ourselves primarily with carbon dioxide because that's generated by the burning of fossil fuels. And that's the component which has changed dramatically in the last couple hundred years. These principles of transmission and trapping of different wavelengths of radiation have been understood for a long time. As early as the early 19th century, it was really brought together in 1896 by Svante Arrhenius, who won a Nobel Prize for other work. And uh, you can see his paper there, which uh, addresses the greenhouse effect. And he actually did calculations on what changes in CO2 would do to the atmosphere, and his prediction was roughly 
doubling would raise average global temperatures by 5C. And that's, uh, we're currently at about a 50% increase over the background pre-industrial revolution. And we've gone a couple degrees up, um, I don't know, 1.8, roughly two. But of course, we don't know uh, if it is going to stop there. Well, we know it's not going to stop there because we're still pumping out CO2. And for all we know, uh, Arrhenius could have been spot on. Certainly, he got the approximate effect correct uh, 130 years ago or so. Arrhenius was concerned with weather and the interplay of water vapor and CO2. Um, we don't know that he had reason to presume there would be a big increase in CO2. He was working on a hypothetical problem at that point, as far as I know. I'll try to do some more research into that. Anyway, that was pretty well known, and in the middle of the 20th century, a scientist named Charles Keeling uh, used some recent advances in spectrometry and chemistry to start measuring atmospheric CO2. Um, his son Ralph is a uh, climate scientist as well and is doing uh, related work today. So uh, this record we're looking at here is from uh, Mauna Loa and the Hawaiian Islands, and it's a good spot because it's high in the atmosphere. It's far from uh, other influences. Um, if you were to make the same measurement, say, right next to a highway, you could get 600 parts per million just from the uh, CO2 coming out of uh, auto exhaust. So this is a site that's good for uh, seeing what the background atmospheric concentration is. And there are other sites around the world that agree with this. It's been a steady increase throughout this record period. Um, these little sawtooths you see are seasonal variation, but they overlay a background of a steady increase from 315 up to 420 or so. I think it's, uh, it was 412, but I believe it's gone up a little bit since then. Actually, no, this is October 22nd. 2020 is the latest on this graph. It's updated daily. So you can see a significant increase in uh, modern times. We can extend those human-made observations back in time quite a bit through the use of ice cores. You can drill in places like Greenland and Antarctica, especially up on the very highest parts of the uh, ice cap where it, the snow is thick and relatively undisturbed. And then you can extract air bubbles that are captured in the ice and measure the CO2 in those, as well as other properties that are helpful. Here we can see the CO2 concentration going back 10,000 years, which is about the length of, I guess, what you'd call civilization. I mean, modern agriculture and cities and societies with government have all pretty much sprung up in that time. And you can see it's pretty constant around 260, 270 until we get to the industrial revolution and it takes off like a rocket. So uh, the footprint that humans have made is really quite remarkable here. We can go back a little further Sorry, I meant to say a lot further. We're looking at 10,000 years, right about here. Ice cores back to almost a million years. And you can see there is actually a lot of variation in that period, uh, but it's all between two, 170 to 270. Regular cycles, uh, you know, they could be influenced by a variety of things. There's changes in solar input. Uh, it's probably more likely the build up and collapse of uh, ice caps. So there's a significant amount of natural va variation in the last million years, which is a significant portion of the evolution of Homo sapiens. Um, once again, you can see that our part of it is much bigger, up to the 
10, 4, 20 or so. So even though there is natural variation, uh, the magnitude of the man-made contribution is much larger. And the rate, this is all dumped in so fast that uh, you, know, you can't really even see it on this graph. So that's a real impact. Now we'll talk a little bit about what that impact does to the physical world. We have pretty reliable human temperature records going back for several hundred years. Remember being in England one spring and the weather forecast saying this is the coldest spring in 220 years, which of course we don't have those kinds of records in this country. Um, there's a lot more data now because we have satellites that can measure more frequently and more widespread. So we have a better idea of the overall global temperature. Um, the upshot is on average, we've gone up 1.5 degrees in the last, uh, since 1850 on this diagram. And uh, for us Americans here, That's about 2.7, almost three degrees Fahrenheit, which is what we're used to. One degree Celsius is equal to 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, this is an average temperature. These changes are not uniformly distributed. Uh, some regions will see, are seeing much larger increases. Some see little to none. Some could potentially be seeing decreases, but overall the average is increasing. It's changing weather patterns, ocean behavior, and so the overall distribution of the uh, of temperatures across the globe is changing, but the trend on average is up. So this is not modeled. We can see the CO2 is increasing and we can see what it's doing. Another effect is sea level. Ice is melting, water is expanding due to it's warming. That seems surprising. The amount that water expands when it's warmed is small, but there's a lot of water and it adds up. So sea level is rising. You can see here from 1880 to today, uh, about 300 millimeters, 30 centimeters. That's a foot of sea level rise there. Once again, it's not uniformly distributed. There's some places that are getting worse some a little better. I think Galveston's seeing a millimeter or so per year, so that's a little bit less than this average. So uh, melting of ice and expansion of water is already, in since the Industrial Revolution started, uh, observable around the globe. Well, I think I'll stop there. We've covered hard data actual measurements taken in the real world, and an understanding of physical processes, the greenhouse effect that many people are familiar with, and shown that man has created warming and sea level rise through the burning of fossil fuels. I just realized there's one thing I've forgot. Um, there's a way to know for sure, other than the correlation uh, with a lot of burning of fossil fuels, that all this increased carbon is from fossil fuels, and that's uh, isotope ratios. There's radioactive carbon. You've probably heard of carbon dating, uh, where you look at carbon-14 versus the 13 and 12. Carbon-14 is continuously formed in the upper atmosphere from cosmic rays. Fossil fuels are buried carbon. Their carbon-14 has completely decayed, so there's essentially zero. And when you uh, burn it and put that carbon into the atmosphere, it has no 14 in it. So it has a distinctive signature, essentially a footprint, a uh, fingerprint that, uh, that tags it as fossil carbon. That's called the Seuss effect, not from uh, Dr. Seuss. Well, from Dr. Hans Seuss, who was a uh, geochemist not a cartoonist, although both he and the real and the cartoonist, Dr. Seuss, Theodore Giesel, lived in La Hala, and they would sometimes get each other's mail. 
Well, that's a little bit of a diversion. Um, there's a lot of other things to talk about, and maybe in a few weeks after some of the other speakers, we can revisit and, uh, and talk a little bit about questions and uh, predictions and things. But uh, for now, I think that's a good solid foundation about what's happening. A well-known historian of literature has written that by the mid of the 1850s, most aristocratic Southerners felt the ab abolition of slavery to be both right and necessary, but they opposed it anyway. The Southern economic life was built on slavery and the question seemed too difficult to solve. Again, I want to make sure you understand that point, that by the mid-1850s, most Southern aristocratic slave owners believed it was immoral, but they believed that it was economically necessary. Today, our, our individual personal economies rely so heavily on the cheap labor provided by oil, that change, and especially a change, a change that seems so radical to what we might call an ecological model that seriously addresses our climate crisis, almost can't be conceived. We are like the southern plantation owners. We can't conceive an economic reality without slavery. And we can continue going on living the way we do because we can get away with it. As whites dominated slaves, we believe that we can continue to dominate nature to our economic advantage. And the only changes we seem to want to consider can be compared to Jim Crow segregation following the abolition of slavery. We need a moral awakening and a willingness to envision a more moral and humble way of living as a human community. This is a theological task we, we need to stop thinking that we can figure out a new way to continue our domination, which, by the way, equals our lifestyle. The scientific community in the US has for years known that we are in a climate crisis that <laughs> will affect our water, including oceans, our air, air, forest, food systems, and temperatures, as well as creating what we might call plagues of warming. <clears throat> as early as 1988, Dr. James Hansen of NASA, of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, first testified before Congress about global warming. He stated that we should be alarmed and that some scientists were editing their findings so as not to alarm the US public. We've heard of other leaders recently who didn't want to alarm the US public. This willingness not to alarm led in large part to climate change denial on the part of the US and was embraced by the Republican Party. We began as a nation taking only baby climate crisis steps and even many of those have now been undone by the present Trump administration. We know, for example, that we have increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the air by about 25% in the last century, 
and will almost certainly double it in this century. We have more than doubled the level of methane and we have added many more gases. To quote Bill McKibben, a well-known ecologist, we have substantially altered the Earth's atmosphere. Many models tell us now that the doubling of these greenhouse gases from pre-industrial revolutionary concentrations means that the global average temperature will increase and that the increase will be 1.5 to 4.5 de degrees Celsius or 3 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit. One of Hansen's colleagues pointed out in 1988, it reaches 120 degrees in Phoenix, Arizona now. Will people still live there if it's 130 degrees, 140? And those temperatures we now know are possible. The temperature in the Death Valley National Park in California reached 130 degrees this summer. At the higher temperatures, 130 to 140, it is possible that human flesh will begin to dissolve. The seas may well rise seven feet or more as polar ice melts and warmer water expands, while the interiors of the continents may dry up because of increased evaporation. This means many countries will be flooded. This past July, one third of Bangladesh was underwater after torrential rains hit the country. 15.5 million people in India and Bangladesh were displaced by flooding this past August. 443 rivers in southern China have flooded since early June, affecting 37 million people. 630 million people are currently living on and below projected annual flood levels for 2,100. Last July, it hit the mid-90s in northern Siberia. The permafrost in parts of Siberia is no longer freezing. This means it is not permafrost, but mud. During, these, during the same time frame, wildfires were burning north of the Arctic Circle. In the fall of that same year, fires erased the town of Paradise, California, killing 88 people. And we are presently witnessing fires destroying acres and acres of the state of California, Oregon, and Washington. The entire coastland of Louisiana is being swallowed up by the sea with 2,000 square miles already gone. The state loses a football field of land every single hour. Let me repeat that again. The state of Louisiana loses a football field of wetland every single hour. The cities of Miami and New Orleans, to name only two, are disappearing into the sea. The rise in temperature and water levels means drastic loss in worldwide food production. The climate change, the climate crisis, will lead to famine in many parts of the world. Many people in the two-thirds world, that's the poor world, the world of the poor, will have no choice but to flee, becoming climate refugees. We have already seen large numbers fleeing Puerto Rico 
after Hurricane Katrina, and coffee farmers fleeing Guatemala presently. But the new number will be in the millions, and where they will go, or better yet, how will they live? We will see at least up to 200 million climate refugees and maybe up to 13 million following the U.S. coastal cities being flooded. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has reported that if we want to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade and prevent absolute planetary catastrophe, we have only a few years. The United Nations Commission has said we have until 2030, 2030, that's less than 10 years, to cut global carbon emissions by 45% and then 20 years to reduce them to zero. In the United States, we are in no way prepared to do this. There is also no worldwide collective effort of the sort that is needed. In fact, carbon emissions continue to rise. In the midst of what some scientists are now calling the sixth great extension in the history of our planet, why do so many people prefer not to be alarmed or engage in outright denial? Some say that the historical roots of our ecological crisis are directly related to theology, that our denial is in large part related to theology. In a 1967 article, Lynn White stated the problem in very clear terms. White wrote that the domination given to humanity over creation in Genesis 1 has long been detrimental to the earth. In both Genesis 1, 26 and 1, 28, the text states that humanity has dominion over all other creatures. We have usually interpreted these verses to mean that we can do whatever we want to the world around us. We can burn fossil fuel, allowing it to warm the planet, we can pollute the air until children develop lung disease at a young age. We can strip mine, dump our plastic waste into the ocean, and fish our rivers in such a way that destroy the fish. Having a God-given right to dominate, we have tended to see ourselves as not being a part of the created order we have tended to rape the earth rather than treat the earth as our beloved life-giving mother. This domination theology has also led us to believe that we can conquer any problem that we encounter as a result of our way of relating to nature. Technology will enable us to breed new forms of fish we can develop sun shields to cool down the earth, or perhaps move the whole population of the earth, or at least some of it, to space colonies. Another major theological issue has been the Bible and the apocalypse. Many Christians have thought that this earth is only a passing home, that in due time, it will know upheavals, come to an end, and Christ will come in glory and either take us away or give us a new earth. A well-known Christian evangelical leader is reported to have said, I know who created the earth, and he is coming back to burn it up, 
So, so yes, I drive an SUV. This eschatological understanding obliviates the need for care of the environment. Anthropocentricism based on Genesis 1 and a, center, and a certain apocalyptic reading of scripture have created serious ecological problems. In the Christian tradition, many people of good faith have put forth the theological concept of stewardship as an alternative to the Genesis 1 domination concept. It is true that the creation story in Genesis 2 is older than the Genesis 1 account. The Genesis 2 account, in the Genesis 2 account, the humans are to till, to t to, to till and keep the garden, earth. The Hebrew word abad is usually translated till and means to work. The Hebrew word shamar which is often translated to keep, has overtones of preserving and defending from harm. Abad and Shamar underlie the doctrine of stewardship, which challenges humans to use widely and sparingly the good things that God has created. This doctrine has helped develop many commendable practices such as rest for the land and the prohibition in Deuteronomy of destroying fruit trees. The doctrine of stewardship has at least three major problems for us today. First, God is viewed as a kind of absentee landlord who has put human beings in charge of the rest of creation and we have not done a very good job. Second, it appears to give humans some priority rights over the rest of creation. Third, it implies that nature is somehow incomplete unless it is improved upon by human hands. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that God dwells in the world in the same way as the soul dwells in the body. The Bible is clear in Genesis 1, 10, 12, that God delights in creation even before the emergence of humans. The Bible affirms the presence and indwelling of God in both humanity and in the rest of creation. The Bible is clear that the purpose of creation is not found primarily in its ability to meet human needs. God acts through all of creation, not just the human. Biblical scholarship has helped us also to better understand the book of Revelation and other apocalyptic writings in the Bible. The book of Revelation was written by a political exile, John of Patmos, to let us know that the Roman Empire was not God. God was God and didn't share many of the values of the empire. John is letting a suffering people know that the empire will fall. Its oppressive values, including those against nature, Roman Empire engaged in massive killing of animals in arenas, for example, are even now being judged by God and found wanting. The old order will pass away. A new earth is possible. We need to hear this word of hope today. The old can pass away and a new earth is possible. This is the end of segment one of the theology and climate crisis section.